Hey everybody, welcome to Celebrate Recovery at the Common Table Online. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with my pride, my desire for perfection, a daily battle with anxiety, and a pull towards depression. And my name is Zach. I'm glad that we're here together tonight. We've got a good evening in store. We've got a testimony, a personal story about power and change that you're going to hear. So as we get ready to start things off, I want you to listen closely, see if there's anything that you can pick away from the story you hear tonight that can give you motivation, hope, encouragement, or that just resonates with you in your personal life and that you can use as a way to move forward. So tonight we're gonna to hear from Andy. He is the National Director of The Landing which is the uh, Celebrate Recovery for Youths. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy and let us all hear a powerful story from him. grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with anxiety and depression, anger and sexual addiction. And my name is Andy and I have the, the privilege to serve as the, the landing director for Celebrate Recovery. Hey, so glad that you're here. Welcome. Uh, and so uh, tonight, uh, like I said, we're going to be doing a, a, a life change story, a testimony, uh, sharing my story of my experience with Celebrate Recovery. I want to share a little bit uh, of my story with you all tonight uh, and, and just the way that Celebrate Recovery ha has impacted me. So uh, if, if you will allow me, I, I would love to, to share uh, my story with you. So a uh, little bit of my story. If I really share the mistakes that I've made and the person that I've been, I'm going to get fired from this church. Is it really going to be a safe place for me? Is there really hope that I can change and stop hiding? I was 23 years old and those were the thoughts that were running through my mind as I stood outside my very first Celebrate Recovery Step Study meeting. I had no idea what I had gotten myself into, and I had no idea how God was planning on working in my life. Uh, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with uh, anxiety, depression, anger, and sexual addiction, and my name is Andy. Uh, I was raised in a wonderful home. I was the middle child of three brothers and a son to a mom and a dad that loved me and my brothers immensely. My parents are both adult children of alcoholics and grew up in homes with a lot of dysfunction. Uh, due to this, they did the best to raise their children in a stable home. And I remember my family uh, being in church for as long as I can remember. And at age nine, I actually accepted Jesus as my savior at an Easter passion play. Uh, although I was brought up uh, with a stable home and I knew Jesus, I still struggled with my own dysfunction and insecurities growing up. Early on, I compared myself to anyone I felt like was better than me somehow. Uh, and my older brother, unfortunately, was someone that seemed to constantly fill this criteria in my mind. And I often felt like a failure when I was around him. A chubby, unintelligent, unathletic failure. And I remember constantly trying to outcompete him in an effort to feel like I carried some kind of value. This never seemed to work, but my desire to prove myself still found a way to work itself out in all of the important relationships and from my family, my friends, and, and of course, all of the girls that I desired to have a relationship with growing up. I just longed to feel like I mattered, like I was the best at something, like I had something to offer some, uh, someone else. This lie that my worth was tied to my performance unintentionally reinforced early on, uh, was reinforced early on in elementary school. Uh, I remember one day in second grade where I counted up all the years of school that I had left and, and I told my mom. And she told me to add four more years to that because she said me and my brothers had to go to college after we graduated high school. That, we, that way we could get a college degree, get a better job than my dad did, and end up making more money than he did. 
Now, I, I will say that my mom and my dad had really good reasons for putting that expectations on my brothers and myself. Neither of my parents had the opportunity to go to college and genuinely believed that it would set us up well to succeed in life and achieve more than what they did, which is such a good thing for a parent to want their kids. But what I didn't realize at the time was that my reaction to this conversation would shape my idea of what success looked like, and it would drive a lot of the decisions that I would make moving forward. I started to realize that I was able to do better than uh, other kids in my grade and my brothers at school. My parents were so proud of me for making straight A's, and that soon became the standard that I would hold myself to all throughout my academic career. Then in fourth grade, after cheating to get A's on a semester's worth of spelling tests, I was recommended for an academically gifted program at school. I went through the testing for the program and was admitted into it for my fifth grade year. Again, my parents were incredibly proud of me, but I felt like a fraud that was in way too deep to come clean. I was now seen as the really smart kid in the family, and I felt like I had no other choice but to live up to that expectation. By the time I hit seventh grade, I was painfully aware of how uncool it was to be known as the really well-behaved, smart kid. I still viewed myself as the chubby, unathletic kid that still endured a lot of bullying targeted me in that way. Uh, not much had changed in the lies that I believed. I still felt unwanted, unlovable, and uncool. Uh, and I thought that maybe if I just had more friends or the right stuff or a girlfriend, then everything would be all right especially a girlfriend. If I had a girlfriend, it would mean that all the girls that I had liked and been rejected by since kindergarten were wrong about me. It was this pain most of all that led me to start viewing pornography when I was in seventh grade. Uh, I had already been exposed to pornographic magazines in third grade uh, at an uncle's house. But when I was 12 years old, I was re reintroduced to pornography after watching an explicit movie on TV one night in a friend's basement. After that situation, I started searching around my house for anything pornographic. I finally found some magazines in the garage, and I would go to them whenever I felt lonely or depressed. Those magazines never rejected me, and in a strange way, they made me feel a whole lot better about myself. This behavior would evolve into an addiction over the next 12 years. Throughout the course of high school, I tried desperately to gain the approval that I was seeking. Fortunately, some of the popular kids liked my sense of humor, and I started to become friends with them. Sure, some of them simply called me the fat kid instead of learning my name, but that didn't really matter to me. I was finally being accepted, and besides, they weren't calling me anything that I wasn't already calling myself. By my final semester of high school, I was on the student council. I had been captain of the football team, and I was well-liked by the right people. I had even managed to achieve a 4.0 grade point average. I was still known as the really good smart kid, but I had most of the acceptance I had thought that I always wanted. And I had pornography to cope with the pain when I felt lonely or depressed or frustrated. Yet I still felt empty inside. And for the next seven months of my senior year in high school, I started to spiral downward. I binge drank alcohol as often as I could. I started lying to my parents and I even started vandalizing private property with my friends. It all culminated with me losing my virginity that summer to an unknown woman in her late 30s. The shame I felt for that was overwhelming. I thought I had hit rock bottom and I tried to ease up on my drinking and my partying. And all this reckless behavior would be forced to stop a month later when I was admitted to a private Christian college in Missouri that would kick me out if I was caught drinking. College was a very difficult time for me. The environment at the school I attended was extremely judgmental and legalistic, and I spent my time there walking the fine line of trying to live the reckless college lifestyle and still trying to keep my image up as a good Christian so I wouldn't get kicked out. Uh, I had already believed up to this point that it wasn't okay for me to fail. But at this college, I learned that if people really knew the real me and the things that I struggle with, I would be completely rejected. So I got really good at hiding my struggles and my pain. I eased up on my partying and alcohol usage for the first two years of college while I was dating a girl that I thought I would marry. But after our relationship ended, my old thoughts of inadequacy and worthlessness came back in full force. And I entered into a strange season of living a double life 
in which I fell back hard into partying and alcohol to deal with the pain of rejection. But at the same time, I also started to pursue a deep relationship with God for the first time in my life. My last two years of college were riddled with an escalating addiction to pornography, a growing dependence upon alcohol, and a long string of unhealthy relationships with a lot of sexual brokenness. But something else happened that surprised me. I started attending and serving at the Baptist Student Union at the college. And I took on a role with the student leadership team there, and I started to grow so much in my relationship with God. Eventually, I was asked to start leading worship at the Baptist Student Union, something I never thought I would do or wanted to do. But I said yes, because I really enjoyed being able to serve as needed, and it felt really good to be needed. During this time, I also met two men named Kyle and Jeremy. Kyle was the director of the Baptist Student Union, and Jeremy was a local worship pastor. And they both poured into me and saw a value in me that I had never seen before or believed was even there. I began to trust these men, and I slowly began sharing some of the pain I was feeling and some of the poor choices that I had been making. Rather than them rejecting me like I thought they would, they simply loved me right there where I was at and walked with me through it. Their patience and grace really allowed me to start growing in my relationship with Jesus as I spent time with them. When I graduated college in 2013, I struggled to find a job, and I ended up working at a, at a retail store for close to minimum wage. I was frustrated that my pain that I was I was frustrated that my plan to find a great job, to make more money than my dad, and to get married wasn't being fulfilled. I was still living in that small town in Missouri at the time, and and. While I was there, Kyle asked me if I would volunteer to lead worship at the Baptist Student Union over the next year. It seemed like Kyle was encouraging me to pursue ministry as a vocation. So I told him I would volunteer until I found a, quote, real job. You see, I never wanted to be a pastor or a worship leader. Full-time ministry didn't fit into the plan that I had made for my life, and so it was never an option for me. But over the next couple of months, leading worship became one of my greatest joys and something that I found a lot of fulfillment in. Then there came a moment where I realized that for my whole life, I had been trying to live my life, my way, under my own plans. And maybe God wanted something different and better for me that I couldn't see. I made a commitment to trust God with the plans for my life and to walk through the doors that he opened for me. If God wanted me to pursue ministry, then I would do it, but he would have to open the door. Soon after, I applied for and was accepted for an intern position or an internship position at a church in Arkansas. And after about six months, I was hired on as a part-time youth pastor for a ministry called The Landing, which was part of something called Celebrate Recovery. That's right, I was actually hired into recovery. I was beyond excited to be working at that church, but my past of poor choices and struggles were weighing so heavy on me. At that time, I had stopped using alcohol and I wasn't pursuing any poor relationships, but I was still addicted to pornography, extremely codependent, and completely insecure in my own abilities. I felt like a giant hypocrite who didn't deserve to work at a church, much less in a recovery ministry, and I believed that I would be fired if anyone knew my past mistakes. It was at this time that my supervisor, a man named Rodney, asked me to join a step study with Celebrate Recovery that he was leading. I wondered if I should just quit right there and get it over with. I wasn't sure if this program was really going to help me, but I figured I'd step through the door that God was opening for me. It's hard to put into words just how strongly God used that step study in my life when I stepped into it at 23 years old. Rodney never once judged me for anything I said in that group. In fact, not a single person in my step study judged me for my past mistakes or failures. You see, before starting to work through Celebrate Recovery, I never felt safe to share my struggles in a church setting because I always thought that no one would understand. But as I worked through the principles and steps of Celebrate Recovery, I started to feel a genuine acceptance and I noticed God subtly changing my life. I started to see real hope in my addiction as I walked with other men that had found victory over so many of the struggles that I was dealing with. And I actually found freedom from pornography for the first time in my life. But more than that, I learned all the reasons why I ran to pornography or alcohol or relationships in the first place. 
I found healing for the deep wounds that were the cause of my own dysfunction. Principle four of Celebrate Recovery, which tells us to openly examine and confess my sins to myself, to God, and someone I trust was particularly impactful for me as I faced the guilt and shame from my past. Through the inventory process, I was able to share all of my deepest secrets with my sponsor, Tim. Rather than feeling judged and condemned, God showed me grace in such a real way when after I finished sharing my inventory, Tim simply said, thanks for sharing and then prayed with me. I learned that I really can examine my ways and test them and then return to the Lord. Step nine helped me to offer forgiveness to those that had hurt me throughout my life, but most of all, I learned how to forgive myself. And I learned in such a fresh way of how great God's grace is for me that I don't have to prove myself. I don't have to fear others' opinions of me and my worth is not defined by what I do. It's defined by who God says I am. Since entering recovery, I've watched God use and change and grow me in ways that I never thought he would or could. I'm now leading my six-step study. I'm sponsoring several men, and I'm serving as the ministry leader for Celebrate Recovery at Fellowship Fayetteville in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've watched God use my story to show others how gracious he truly is as he recycles my pain and my fears. I've watched God peel back more and more layers of my heart to continue to make me look more and more like Jesus. I've watched God show me that I am never alone in my struggles, that there's always someone who's been down this road before me and who understands. I've watched God show me time and time again how powerless I am, but how he's powerful on my behalf and how he's always been holding me in the palm of his hands. And I've watched God reveal to me just how deeply he loves me, the real me, not the fake me that I try to be. That God also values me and he desires to know me more and more. On January 13th of 2018, I married my incredible wife, Julia, who I met soon after I started that internship and who had actually volunteered with me when I was working with The Landing. Both of us walked through step studies before we were married, and I'm beyond grateful for the foundation that that has given us in our marriage, the way that we both feel safe and vulnerable with each other, and and the way we are both more aware of our emotions and our expectations, and the way we both have an incredible forever family that will push us closer and closer to God and each other. December 1st of this past year, my wife and I were blessed by the birth of our first child, our daughter named Harper. I'm incredibly thankful to have the tools of Celebrate Recovery as I enter parenthood, and I honestly don't know how anyone made it through raising children without first being a part of recovery. Becoming first-time parents in the middle of a pandemic has been incredibly difficult, and God has graciously shown me that there still is work that he's planning on doing in my heart. But one thing is for sure, this season has only deepened the gratitude that my wife and I have for the foundation that Celebrate Recovery has given us to step into parenting with confidence and with a community around us. We're definitely not a perfect couple, far from it actually, but Celebrate Recovery has given us the tools to grow our marriage and family around an authentic and real relationship with Jesus. The community Julia and I have found here at Celebrate Recovery has been beyond valuable to us, especially uh, over the past two and a half years as we've walked through some of the toughest seasons of dysfunction in both of our families and difficult illnesses. On July 4th of 2018, my older brother was diagnosed with leukemia, and my family thought he only had weeks to live. I sent out a prayer request to, (laughs) to my forever family when I heard the news and I immediately got a call from Rod to let me know that my forever family was with me and was praying for my family. It it means the world to me to know that I have a community of safe people that will walk with my wife and I through the middle of life's ups and downs. And by the way, almost three years later, my older brother is still in the treatment process, but he is in remission and he is recovering. I am so incredibly thankful that God has led me to celebrate recovery. And I can honestly say that the man here tonight is a completely different one that walked into that step study over six years ago. Celebrate recovery has completely changed my relationship with Jesus, 
my relationship with my family and the way that I approach life's hurts and wounds. I am not put together or perfect, but that's okay because Jesus died for imperfect people. It's still a daily battle and choice to surrender to Jesus, but I know in my heart now that his strength, healing, and hope are possible. If tonight is the first time that you've stumbled across Celebrate Recovery, or maybe if you just find yourself in a tough spot in your life, I want you to know it's not a mistake that you're watching this. God knows your story. He knows your wounds and knows the baggage that you're carrying with you. And you know what? He loves you exactly where you're at, but he also loves you far too much to leave you where you're at. Jesus desires to enter into our weaknesses because in our weaknesses, his power is made perfect. And I pray that you will give him a chance to show you just how much he loves you and how willing he is to heal you. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which is my life verse, it says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because of the incredible love and forgiveness of Jesus, it does not matter where we've been, what we've done, or what has been done to us. Jesus desires to do away with our old lives through the cross and give us the ability to live a new life of freedom and hope. It simply takes trusting him at his word and accepting the help he offers. We say often in Celebrate Recovery, don't quit before your miracle happens. If God still loves me, he still loves you too. And if God can change me, he can change you too. Thank you so much for letting me share with you. Uh, Forever family, uh, we love you. Thank you so much for being here on you. And uh, and again, if you are watching this uh, tonight and, and there's stuff going on within your life, I want you to know that there is still hope and healing that uh, is available for you uh, to just reach out and grab. Uh, if God can change my life, he can change yours too, I promise you. Thank you for sharing, Andy. What a powerful story. Well, what a powerful testimony. As Andy was closing, one of the things that just stuck with me was when he said that God loves us just who we are and where we are, but he loves us far too much to leave us where we are. So I hope you let that sink in because no matter where we are in our faith or recovery journey, there's always a next step for us. We can always progress. We can always grow closer to our higher power. We can always step further out of our hurts, our habits, and hangups. So I'll challenge you as we wrap things up tonight and get ready to head into the weekend. What's the next step for you? Because your higher power loves you way too much to be complacent with where you are now. So I'll challenge you. I hope you can challenge me as well. Let's grow together. Let's progress together. Let's look to take the next step together. Thank you for being here tonight. Go with God. Go in peace. Be a changed people and progress.